Hello. It's been seven years since I filmed the sections that make up the earlier part of this DVD, and I thought it would be a good idea to go back over the issues that were raised back in 2003 and see what's changed in the areas of coastal erosion and government policy. At the time, I was able to show you some of the northern coastal areas of the Isle of Man that were eroding and speak to a politician about the consultant's report on the effects of coastal erosion and the options for dealing with it. I've come back to some of the places we visited first time round to see if coastal erosion has had any effect and whether the predictions in that report have in fact come true. And now there's another element that's very much on the agenda, global warming. In a moment, we'll speak to someone who will give us their assessment on the effect that this will have on the Isle of Man. But first, let's visit some of the places we highlighted as being vulnerable to coastal erosion. Let's see how they've been getting on. In 2003, I spoke to David Greenwood, who lived at Carlin Mill, a small house perched on the northwest coast whose garden had been washed away in a great storm in 1990. David had put his own rock armour in front of his garden to try and protect his land. How well has that worked? This great pile of rocks is still here, so the garden above is still safe. Yet, it's the land either side that's definitely suffered. And if we go around the other side, we can see just what's been happening. It's well known that structures like this can actually increase coastal erosion. And here's how it works. If this line represents the sand cliffs behind me, and this rock, the rock armour, then when the tide comes in from this direction, the rock armour makes it swirl around and dissolve the cliff, speeding up the rate of erosion. When I was last here seven years ago, this cliff had a distinctive curve and this headland came out to pretty much where I'm walking now. It just goes to show how dramatic the effects of coastal erosion have been in this area in recent years. Seven years ago, I took you further along the coast here to see someone else's attempt at stopping coastal erosion below their house. Let's see how they're getting on. I showed you the gabions, wire baskets filled with stones that the owner had placed at the bottom of the cliff at huge expense. The cliff above them was green with vegetation, the roots of which were helping to stabilise the cliff. But look at it now. The sea has almost completely destroyed the gabions. What's left of them now stand even further from the cliff. It's not that they've moved, rather that the sea has swirled in behind them, washing the cliffs away. The farm above is now closer to the edge, and since filming from the helicopter, there's been another major collapse of the cliff onto the beach, as the sea eats away at the cliff's base. Talking of being close to the edge, this report, prepared by consultants for the Manx government 10 years ago, gives detailed estimates as to how long they think threatened properties have got until they fall into the sea. It makes rather interesting reading. For example, Ballatier was predicted to start falling into the sea in 12 years' time. That was 11 years ago, so in effect, it is just one year to go. Other properties were predicted to fall into the sea in six or seven years, so by now they should have gone. In fact, they haven't. One of them, of course, was Carlin Mill, but we can see that the owner's work to protect it has given it a stay of execution. Here at Glen Willen, the Clearwater Trout Farm was predicted to have gone two years ago. But, as we can see, it's still down there. Though if you compare it to the footage we took in 2003, it is nearer the edge, and the small pond has all but gone. So, you can see, predicting the rates of coastal erosion isn't an exact science. It does work both ways, though. Although rates have been slower than expected during the last 10 years, a sudden tidal surge during a wild winter storm can make up for that, 
and rip huge sections of coast away. And no one knows when that might happen. In some places, a surge in coastal erosion can have a catastrophic effect. I'm travelling to the northern tip of the island, to just such a place. I was here seven years ago, and if there has been a substantial increase in erosion since then, then we've got a problem. This is the site of Wright's Pit East. Now, I don't know whether Mr Wright's happy or not that he's got a rubbish dump named after him, but it does look rather smart since it was closed and landscaped in 2005. This is how it looked when we were last here. Tens of thousands of tonnes of rubbish being dumped and levelled. All the bin wagons on the island had to drive up here each day to empty their load. We don't do that anymore because we now have a shiny new incinerator. The bin wagons now come here from all over the island and dump the rubbish into a huge concrete lined pit. A giant claw mixes this up and lifts the rubbish into a chute, which leads to the incinerator itself. The burning waste produces heat, which is used to generate electricity. And the bottom ash and bits of metal are all that remain to be disposed of. It's good news for the environment here, as this giant landfill site has been covered over and landscaped. And in a few short years, the heathland will return, and you'd hardly ever know it was here. Or would you? The problem is, it's very close to the sea. And the question surely has to be how long until the erosion starts to eat away at the side of this buried rubbish. The coast up here is moving in two directions. The actual point of air is growing each year as more stones are deposited and it's growing in a southerly direction. But just down from the point, it's a different story. The coast is slowly eroding. From the air, Wright's Pit East is now a large pale rectangle, and its bottom left-hand corner is perilously close to the beach. But how much has gone since I last filmed here? Well, this is very interesting. First, let me remind you of where I spoke from in 2003. Now, the experts assure us that this section of the coast isn't eroding, although it is midpoint between the severe... I was sat right here. And as you can see, this area is eroding. Nothing major, but these cliffs are definitely on the move. The problem is, this loose sand and shingle is easily dislodged by wind and rain, let alone the battering from a stormy high tide. Although less than a metre has gone in eight years, there's no doubt that there is steady erosion. And don't forget that catastrophic event in 1946, when a violent storm took two metres of coast away over a distance of three kilometres in one night. So. It seems clear that the coast is eroding towards the edge of Wright's Pit East. It's difficult to say how long this could take, but at some point in the future, the sea might be lapping up against the edge of this landfill site. And at this point in time, if nothing is done, then thousands of tons of rubbish could be washing out to sea. In 2003, the Department of the Environment told me that they had buried great concrete markers at the edge of the tip that would be revealed if the land eroded to that point. In fact, they decided to go for these markers instead. When the eroding coast gets to here, then someone has to take action. I don't know what the options would be, 
maybe moving all the tons of rubbish to somewhere else, or even taking it to the incinerator. But it would be a massive task. The heath will grow over all of this, and in a few years' time, you'll never know it was here. But I am assured it's on government maps and being constantly monitored. But as erosion is a real issue, this could be a major problem for future generations. So what other developments have there been since 2003? Well, there has been one very big development here in Kirkmichael, and it's very controversial. These houses were built in 2005, and the development was nicknamed the King Canute Estate by the local commissioners, because the houses have been built on land that is so close to the sea. According to this report, this land could be threatened in just 50 years if coastal erosion rates speed up from what they have been recently. And what nobody knows is whether global warming will have any effect on all of this. But we'll talk more about that in a moment. You can see from the aerial shots the large empty field before 2005. Now look at it again since that time with the houses built much to the local commissioner's surprise and annoyance. They opposed the application by Dandara, and John Barron, who was a member of Kurt Michael Commissioners at the time, told me why it was so controversial. The main controversy was the amount of coastal erosion that has happened in the last 50 years, and this land has been under threat, and we were very concerned that if they built houses on this land in another 30 years' time, they, they would be under threat as well. What was your reaction when planning permission was granted for this estate? The commissioners were, were very surprised that, that they actually got permission to build here. We were shocked actually that the, uh, the inspector gave the go-ahead for them to be built. There's so much land around here that could be built on to actually to give the go-ahead here, and especially first-time buyers' houses. We opposed it on the grounds of, of, of the erosion, of the land, and the amount of erosion that's happened in the last 50 years. It's just continuous. And we were very concerned that if it was built here in, in another 30 years, these houses would be under threat. I've been here over 50 years now, lived all my life here. There was fields and there was an old mill down here. There was a, a bungalow that had to be demolished. There's quite a, two or three fields all beyond there that has disappeared in the last 50 years. The government's view is buyer beware. Do you think that's a fair attitude? Well, it probably is now, but originally, I think if you can't trust the government planners, it's, it's not really fair on, on the people that's actually bought houses here that, that are under threat now. I mean, the government should be responsible enough to say, no, that we, shouldn't, we can't build here. But if they say, oh, yes, you, you can build and it's up to you to, to worry about it afterwards, I don't think it's fair on the actual people that bought the houses. So, I, I, you know, I think they do have a responsibility to the people that, that bought these houses to, to try and protect them in some way. In the end, it's the government's responsibility for ever allowing those houses to be built in the first place. Morning, Minister. John Shimon is the Minister for Environment, Food and Agriculture. And I asked him why this development has been allowed. I think that's one of the dilemmas for government and people, particularly in an island. When developers are keen to develop properties and there's a demand for them, then we have to look at what is going to be the likelihood of that property being affected in the future. We have only created one management zone, which is in the Kirkmichael area, to ensure that no developments will take place within an area of the coast. The one you're talking about is further inland, inevitably may be under vulnerable threat within 100 years plus. However, we could sterilise too much of the land just in case. So we try and get that balance between allowing development to take place but ensuring that the information is available for purchasers of properties to see if they decide it's worth the risk. So when it comes down to it, the bottom line, whose responsibility is it? Is it government's responsibility or is it the individual's? I think the government has an enormous responsibility to protect the infrastructure of the Isle of Man. I think individuals have a responsibility to protect their own assets. Now we will attempt to try and ensure that developments don't take place in those areas that are going to be prone to erosion. And we're not dealing with this on the Isle of Man alone, this is a problem for all coastal areas. The real unknown in this is the speed of the damage that could be caused by the climate change and the rising of the sea levels. So that's something which everybody has to take into account. 
we have already taken action to make sure that there's a protected area in the Mike Kirk Michael area and I think we'll have to do that further in the future and the balance to answer your question is the government has responsibility to all the taxpayers of the Isle of Man and individuals have responsibility for their own decisions. You've mentioned the Coastal Management Act in 2005. Is it the long-term view of the government to actually manage the coast instead of protecting it? It actually allows government to take action in areas that are prone to coastal erosion. So we are aware that in certain areas we still require infrastructure. Individuals still have the right and the need to do certain things in these areas. Most of this land is in private ownership by farmers or uh, people who have a right to use that land. What it does, it means that we've got an element of control to make sure that they confer with the Department of Government in order to make sure that what they do is not going to cause an adverse effect. I think we have to remember that we're talking about 50 or 100 years ahead. And if we look back on what the changes are in the Isle of Man and technology over that period of time, I think the next 50 to 100 years are going to challenge mankind to find solutions to some of these problems. Therefore, I don't know what the answer will be, but certainly all coastal areas that are vulnerable are trying to look for solutions and mankind are very ingenu have great ingenuity in trying to come forward with a better solution. I think the big danger is actually putting in current measures of protection which actually just move the problem further down the coast. Of course, one thing that the report written in 2000 didn't take into account was the effect of global warming. You'll be aware that there's a great deal of controversy about whether the warming is man-made or not and a great deal of uncertainty about its speed and the exact effect it will have. There are all sorts of scenarios, but the wildest predictions would have large portions of the Isle of Man underwater in just a hundred years. In fact, the northern plain, deposited during the last ice age, would eventually be washed away. And as you looked out from the northern hills, there would only be sea. And where the TT course runs along the bottom of those hills, there would once again be a beach. But if global warming leads to an increase in winds, rain and storms, which is one of the scenarios, then the erosion around the Isle of Man will only get faster and the time left for the houses at Kirk Michael will only become shorter. So to get an expert view on the possible effects of global warming on the island, I've come to see Emeritus Professor Trevor Norton, marine biologist and critically acclaimed author. I asked him if global warming would in fact affect coastal erosion here on the Isle of Man. Almost certainly, yes it will. The two factors that are most important in coastal erosion are uh, the height of the waves and the frequency of the storms. And all the predictions are that both those things will increase in the near future. And they're going to do it quite substantially. It's obvious that sea level, for example, will go up because if, any, if there's warming in the atmosphere, the sea will get warmer, it'll expand, if it expands, it'll rise. And there's all this water locked up as ice in glaciers and, uh, and ice caps. And as that starts to melt, where does it go? It goes into the sea. So it's certain to go up. So what sort of rises are we looking at? What do the predictions say? How much of a rise in sea level are we going to get? Well, rem remember that it's, it, sea level is not actually a static thing. It has been fairly static recently, but in the past it's, it's varied really very widely. Um, during the peak of the Ice Age, the, the, the level of the sea was 120 metres lower than it is now. That Irish elk that's in the Manx Museum didn't swim across here from Ireland, it walked. It's as simple as that. And when the ice began to melt, it melted at a tremendous rate and the sea started to rise again. It was, it was melting at the rate of four metres every century. That's the amount of rise in the sea level from that time. So it's very, very substantial. So, looking towards the future then, how much of a rise are we going to see here on the Isle of Man? Well, it's very, very difficult to know, give you a def definitive answer, because every time they do add something to their models, the prediction goes up. But the current prediction, which is very recent, is that 
they reckon that within this century it will go up by a metre and possibly even by two metres. So if we're looking at a metre, if I say that to somebody, oh, it's only about this high, that doesn't sound very much. Uh, no, but you've got to remember that in a storm, a, a, an extra metre on top of the waves is hugely amplified and makes a big difference. And one of the problems that the other prediction of, um, of, of climate change is that storms, the weather will be much more extreme, we'll have drier, hotter summers apparently, but we'll have winters which are much wetter and where there are far more storms. And what they're predicting is those storms that come only once every 50 years, a really big storm, will become much more frequent and perhaps even as frequent as every six or seven years. Now that means this, the rate at which a wave will chomp away at cliffs is going to be hugely increased. So for the young people watching this programme, are they going to see these kind of changes and these effects in their lifetime? I would have thought so. Um, if, as predicted, we'll have a, perhaps a, a half a metre rise by 50 years hence, then I think they'll see the headlines in the paper about uh, land missing in the northwest of the island, and that'll be in the papers almost every day, I suspect. And if this frequency of storms increases, as it's supposed to, then they'll hardly miss the windows rattling in the storm and the roof tiles being made into frisbees. Uh, well, first year I came to the island, that's exactly what happened to me. I thought, where on earth have I come to? And every one of the students I taught, I said, what will you remember about the island? The first thing they said was, the wind. So storms are a thing we've already got in, in abundance. And if it gets worse, you'll certainly notice it. So that's a look at what's happened over the last seven years since I made the earlier part of this programme. Coastal erosion is still at work, changing the coast, threatening properties and causing problems for residents and for government. And it remains to be seen what will happen when coastal erosion starts to threaten the Kirkmichael housing estates. Meanwhile, just to give you an idea of what might be involved if the Manx government decided to protect the several kilometres of coast at Kirkmichael, take a look at the recent runway extension safety area project at Ronaldsway Airport. Although the scheme was to extend the coast rather than to protect it, it would mean a similar engineering project to absorb the energy of the sea and save the sand cliffs. Huge barges were towed over from Norway, which had a supply of the particular type of rock required. 185,000 tonnes of it. The barges were held in position by a tug whilst the rocks were offloaded and placed at the perimeter of the site, making it into a giant lagoon. The average weight of the rocks was 20 tonnes, but some of them weighed nearly 50 tonnes. After all the rock armour was in place, the old yellow gantry was removed and the site was lined, after which it was filled with sand. This was an extraordinary spectacle. A specially adapted vessel had sucked 324,000 cubic metres of sand off the floor of Morecambe Bay in northwest England and delivered it into the lagoon. A group of bulldozers spread the sand evenly around the site and it all looked so remarkable that even the airport firemen turned out to watch. The whole site was levelled and tarmacked, and now looks like it was always there. But even this small scheme cost over £23 million, so just imagine how much it would cost to save the coast at Kirkmichael. Thank you.